So this is the uh, lecture on, on, on sequence generation. It, it, it was long in coming, right? Because you, you, I have been essentially referring to sequence generation ever since um, the lectures in high dimension fields for, from then on processes were sequentially operating like in the visual search example that was the case um, and um, uh, what else um, I, I at one point I did change detection which worked that way and of course in these last uh, the, the relational thinking we had sequences like that now this is a very general topic of course because uh, pretty much everything you do any action, and in fact, every thought is usually part of a sequence, right? You, you don't achieve anything reasonable by just one act or one, one movement or one gaze shift. So you do this uh, always, you know, sequence, uh, chain things up. <clears throat> and, um, and these can be, sometimes can be very automatic. So you're not even thinking about opening your hand before you grasp something, right? That is an automatic chaining where you're the opening and closing and your transport is uh, connected in some fixed way. And when you walk, you don't think about, you know, left foot up, right foot down or something, right? It's highly automatic. Um, but it can also, you know, sometimes I say sometimes uh, ordering is also fixed in the sense, logically, you cannot go through a door before you open it, right? So there's some uh, so a real constraint. So you're not very flexible on certain things. You, you have to first open your computer and then you can type on it and so on. But it can also be uh, flexible. Let's say the other extreme would be serial order. If somebody tells you a phone number, then uh, you can get the order right and, and dial it in that order. And the order is significant, right? If it's a different number if you don't get it right. And uh, when you're planning things, you you uh, your logic can sometimes actually constrain plans, but you can conceive of different ways of doing things in different orders. Uh, and maybe the highest form of using sequential thoughts and actions is when you're solving a problem, when you're trying to go from one place to another in terms of some operations, maybe repairing something or uh, assembling something or in terms of more abstract things like a an argument or even a mathematical proof and so on. So that's a sequence of steps and the ordering is quite critical for that. And you're figuring out that order and there might be many orders that you have to consider and then you have to find the right one. Maybe there are more than one that work, but uh, not just any will work. So uh, arguing, uh, hopefully this is kind of obvious to you that it's very important to understand how you can bring about different actions and thoughts in serial order and that it's a system that's challenged by being flexible even though it might have constraints <clears throat> and uh, translating that into our theory then we would say any individual action or uh, any individual thought or representation of an intermediate stage will be a attractor state right it will be a peak in a, in a field or it will be a node being activated a subpopulation being activated and it's important that it's stable for the reasons that you saw all along for it to be able ultimately to be grounded to uh, be selective in terms of its sensitivity to input to resist change. Uh, of course, resisting change is a good thing so that you can you are not easily thrown over by some distractor input, but it is also resisting the change that might be required in a sequence because in a sequence, a previous state needs to yield to a new state. And so technically that really will just mean that the stable state has to become unstable. So you have to induce an instability in order to bring about the sequence. And so I will spend some time talking about how that happens in in field theory and then a separate issue is what then do you do next once you have uh, made a state unstable you know what next state are you going to get these are sort of two separate problems i first want to illustrate this an example which is also historically how we approach that this very nice example maybe i will um get not much further than just going through this example um so in this example we had a vehicle move through an environment um, and again, we used color because it's so easy to get that from the camera. The vehicle had a camera on board and we taught the vehicle to go through the environment and try to seek out in the sense of moving toward and until it's really big on the camera uh, uh, toward uh, targets of a certain color 
in an order of color. So we were asked you to first find the blue object and then find the red object. And then uh, number three is missing here. And then find the th green object, let's say. Um, and by the, the vehicle was able to avoid obstacles, which uh, essentially made it move a little bit in some complicated way and didn't have a map of the world. So uh, in this task, uh, the vehicle needs variable and ultimately unpredictable amounts of time to achieve one set and then do the next uh, you know, one target and then find the next target and find the next target. That was a feature because we wanted to look at a solution of that that is uh, really um, monitoring the achievement of the task and is not, for instance, just a rhythmic activity. So when you, uh, I had hinted earlier in, in or actually that was in the different semester, that you can uh, generate, of course, sequences in the sense of making rhythmic movements, but uh, generating some kind of oscillator state. And, uh, and that will be some form of very stereotypical uh, sequence sequencing would just consist of not having fixed points attractors but having that periodic uh, solution as an attractor so it's a stable oscillation and if you wire that up correctly you could make that at every cycle you do something different um, and there are actually a lot of uh, neural models in the literature that deal with uh, serial order that are like that that are actually just periodic processes where you insert a new uh, input at every stage of an oscillator, every oscillation of, of a neural oscillator. But um, that's not a solution. The solution would have to uh, entail that the action and maybe even the thought, you know, can take variable amounts of time and you're moving on to the next action only when you're done with the previous one. Now, even thoughts are like that. We have some thoughts that take longer to form and then uh, you don't want to lose where you are to, or move on to the next thought, even though the previous thought wasn't really achieved. Uh, it's an obvious movement, as I'm pointing out here. Uh, <clears throat> so this is just the text that says that same thing. And here's actually uh, two videos. I just uh, want to illustrate that. Uh, so this is how we did this concretely. So the vehicle uh, has a camera. This green thing is just to track it. There's some, some paper on top here. Um, and it has a camera and has some sensors for obstacle avoidance. And in the teaching, the uh, research, and this is Julia Sanemiska who developed this in her PhD thesis, she shows the robot objects in a particular order. So once if you go through that here, now for instance, she's showing the uh, robot a yellow uh, blob, and then she shows a red one, I believe, and then she shows it a green one, and then she shows it a blue one, I guess, and then yeah, and so, so, and then the last one is, is it red? Uh, I don't remember. So the, the, I've uh, written down the sequence here in, on top if I'm not uh, mistaken. Uh, <clears throat> there's actually a little subtlety here in that you see, if I do this fast, you might see this here that she is actually showing an object and then she's moving it closer to the robot as it's showing, you know, a little bit closer to the robot, which makes it larger on the robot camera. And it will be actually that which will trigger the robot to recognize now it's a, now I'm done learning that. So this will be the teaching where we store in memory of this robot. It's actually learned in synaptic connections. Uh, teach this robot the sequence. And then we're putting this robot into a different uh, scenario where we've put in some objects here in the environment and having that robot move around the environment more or less randomly. Uh, it, it, again, it just really just does obstacle avoidance and uh, when it encounters an object of the correct uh, color, it moves toward the object until it's really large. So for instance, here, this is how it, it has seen this as a um, yellow object. You see now it moves really close and now it's done with yellow and now it will not, for instance, there's another yellow one. It isn't going for the yellow one. It's actually going for the red one. And the next one, I think is the green. Like here, it's just doing random stuff. Uh, obstacle avoidance, and then you see here, I think here, yeah, here it's uh, really recognized the green as something it wants to do. And I believe the next one, and here's another red, it ignores that red and it ignores that green. And ultimately I think it finds the long term, now it finds the blue. And I think only then it was actually going again for red here, right? So it already shows what I wanted to show next. That a real special feature here is that this um, has a goal in mind to find a particular color 
and it persists in pursuing that goal uh, and can ignore distractors, which would be colors that it is interested in at some other point in the, st in the sequence. And that, that's very much the point of this uh, experiment. So I think I've, um, yeah, this just states that. And I think I made this little uh, contrast here. This is similar moments in the video. So this is a moment when it is looking for, I think, for blue and it goes by this red, you know, say it has it good on, well on the camera and doesn't turn toward it and ignores it as a distractor. While this is at a, sorry, at a later stage where it really uh, goes for the red because that's, uh, and then it's done with the red. Uh, so, so this ability to uh, stabilize a goal, a resistant distractor uh, versus, um, uh, you know, so, so here red as a distractor versus red as a target, that, that's uh, the idea to be able to organize that. Um, so uh, here, I mean, I'll take you through this particular solution and probably I'll end on uh, extracting the general principle from that. And then next week I will uh, generalize that and, and embed it in a more general account of, um, of sequence generation. Uh, so we actually made multiple solutions to that from which our uh, repertoire of how we do this uh, emerged. And I'm showing you first a, a slightly different version. Actually, this is not quite the right figure because the first thing I'll show you didn't have this thing here on top. I'll, um, I'll just show you here this bottom part. Um, but the, the, the central idea to all of these examples is the same. It's what we call the mechanism of the condition of satisfaction. Uh, we really got that term from Searle's uh, theory of intentionality and the philosophers, philosophers among you uh, uh, will know that term. Uh, it's in the theory of intentional states, it's a logical condition for when an intention is, uh, you know, is satisfied. That is, uh, there in, in, in this form of philosophy, there are two kinds of uh, intentional states. It's uh, uh, motor-like states where uh, you intend to do something and uh, you, it will be, uh, you will have succeeded in bringing about your intentions or your Conditional satisfaction is fulfilled if there, something happens uh, that you caused. For instance, you want to lift your arms of a certain example. And when your arm is up because you lifted it, then that intention has been realized and you are satisfied. So, something, if you consider the arm as part of the world, something in the world uh, changed um, and, and matched your intention. And that's what we usually think of intuitively as intention. Philosophers also call perception like things intentions, and we do that in our projects as well. So for instance, when you perceive an object, then they have an intention state in the sense there's some activation in your brain that is about that object. And it is, it is satisfied, the conditions of satisfaction fulfilled if, if your mind, so the activity in your mind matches the world. So that's the mind to world direction of it. And I will come back to that in this final lecture about intentional systems. So here, these are all uh, conditional satisfaction. In this context will always be this motor like conditional satisfaction that's called world to mind uh, direction of it in this jargon of the philosophers. And so we had this uh, specific idea when, when we worked on this very hard. It's, it's not actually as obvious as one first might think how to do that. Um, I'll, I'll explain that a little later, what, what, what's not obvious about it. So um, our general notion was that when we intend something, so we have some goal for that system. So here the intention is to, to seek some color. We represent that neurally by having a um, stable state here in a field defined over color. We call this the intention field. Uh, so this would be like looking for green currently, right? So when we intend something, then uh, we're we hypothesize that you, then you do two things. On the one hand, with that intention, you drive your system. So downstream here, it will be really driving ultimately the robot. Um, and on the other hand, you're predicting the outcome. So you're predicting, this is this error, what sort of sensory signal you would get if you uh, were done with that. So here we're predicting, here's trivial in the sense it's color to color. There was, if we want to get something green, then we would be done if we see something green. So we have another field we call the condition of satisfaction field that 
uh, is in this case also over color. You could imagine many other cases it wouldn't be uh, exact same dimension. And uh, when we say predict, that means we give some input to that field that is localized in, at the color that we want, but that input itself is not enough to activate that field. Uh, what we will then do is uh, we will you know, bring about the action in some way. And when, uh, as a result of that action, we get a visual input that matches this expectation, meaning we get, for instance, input in color space, we extract the colors from the image and the number of items will determine how much activity or uh, what the size of the input. So when we have a, an object large on the retina, meaning a lot of uh, uh, green pixels, then there will be a lot of input at green and the, that input overlapping with that prediction. So two sources of input overlapping can create a detection instability. Then this field will generate a peak and then we will say, we have, we're done. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> We're done, that is. We have uh, achieved the intention. And um, what then further happens is that uh, this peak of in the condition set section will actually have an inhibitor influence. And this architecture goes through something special, which I will ignore for now. But you could think ultimately it really just uh, kills that intention in a sense, inhibits that intention. And therefore, the um, system is no longer trying to find uh, the green color. And uh, that has two consequences. Yeah, it has, has that consequence. And if this peak goes, then whatever it dictated on to the robot behavior goes away. But it also no longer gives input to this field. And if we arrange the thresholds to be right, that will mean that even though this gets sensor input, it no longer sustains the peak because this prediction goes away. And therefore this peak will go away. And if that peak goes away, the inhibition goes away, and if the inhibition goes away, this system can create another peak. And the question, which other peak it creates, that is how you select the next action that I'll have to talk about. So uh, here, just a few elements of this uh, illustrate in a little bit more detail. So for instance, the way that this uh, uh, visual search worked here, this is a form of visual search, right? You, you say, I seek a green thing, and now you're searching for that uh, green thing. You're not searching in on the retinal array, you're searching by the vehicle moving around. Actually, just go straight unless obstacle avoidance makes a turn. And so um, we're ex just interested in a one dimensional representation of space because the vehicle can just turn. So all the pixels um, that are at the same horizontal position are summed up and they are classified according to the uh, shoe, dominant shoe value within each uh, pixel. And uh, from the summing of that, we make a histogram over hue space. Uh, so this is the number of strength is the number of pixels that contribute to that color slot. And for instance, in this case, at that, uh, in that scene, there would be uh, quite a lot of uh, pixels at yellow. That's why I put that here in yellow. This would be the location along color space where yellow is. Um, and, and so that would be measuring how much, this is a sensory signal about the feature, how much yellow there is and um, you um, the, um, the the space features uh, ensemble um, has uh, you know has two dimensions has, uh, visual one dimensional visual space and then along color the strength of the input into this field is is essentially the uh, color histogram um, at um, it's just a color histogram at a particular location. So uh, once the color histogram within that region is the input to that. Um, that's how the 2D representation works. And um, now, so there are these two parts, unfortunately, I sort of flipped the order here in this plot. So this is how the intentional state acts onto uh, the uh, behavioral level, and this is the condition of section. In the other picture, it was the condition of section was to the right. So when I intend this particular color, I'm pre-activating the condition of satisfaction. This is the prediction. So I'm predicting that in, in color, I should have a peak here, and this is below threshold, doesn't generate a particular peak. And on the other hand, I'm acting onto the robot um, uh, vision system uh, to by erecting this ridge uh, in a long space 
uh, in, in color, that's your visual search, right, that you're familiar with. So um, in this system, see it's all below thresholds here. In the system, a peak will arise if there is localized input that overlaps with the ridge. That's when I would have found an object. So as long as I haven't found any matching object, there it will be no peak here and the system will be just going straight. That is, it has, uh, as I explained in that last lecture before for Christmas, the uh, heading direction dynamics has zero uh, you know, homogeneous uh, state, so it just will keep whatever heading it has, and then obstacle avoidance can shift that around. But as soon as the peak arises, it will actually then steer to the spatial direction at which that peak lies. So that that's when it will steer toward the object. Because it moves forward, the object will become very large until, um, first of all, the condition of satisfaction hits, which I'll explain now. And of course, it will also ultimately avoid obstacles and then turn away from that ob object. So, um, so these, the, these scene objects make these localized inputs because they have color and a horizontal location. And so what we're looking at is when an input is on top of that ridge, that's when there's a chance to form a peak. So th this uh, seems to be happening right here. Maybe this is the yellow example. So when that happens, um, the, op the robot will move toward the object. And at the same time, we're continuously generating a signal for the condition of satisfaction, that is actually just uh, the uh, uh, global uh, histogram over the entire image of uh, colors. And we have a different threshold here. So for instance, currently you have uh, green, uh, yellow, red, and so on. These are different uh, locations here along color space and they all have some pixel count. And the idea is that as you move very close to this obstacle, the pixel count of the appropriate color hopefully Will become very large. We'll have a threshold here, a mapping here onto um, choosing the such that that will be then sufficient to lift this beyond detection instability. So that, so if if the big peak here arises at the pre-activated location, then the condition of satisfaction field will form a peak uh, and not before. So this is a. Uh, set of life simulations, unfortunately, from a slightly different system. Uh, so what you see here is when a detection occurs and, and that is a one-dimensional representation of the switch. Uh, so uh, for instance, currently you're looking for that color and you see there is no, nothing, that's this ridge, nothing overlaps with that ridge yet. And when something starts to come up here, what's just the case, then there is a switch, which means this peak goes away and the next one is loaded. The way the next one is loaded, then I haven't explained, that's different here in the system than another one. So for instance, here currently there is no, this is not yet above threshold, but I think this one is, this one ends up being, yeah. So when this is above threshold, it happens and then the old state goes away and switches to the next one. And again, so it's always happening here when he, this is where the overlap is measured, yeah. Now it's moving to this object and the condition of session fires and goes on, right? So, so you can get a first sense for some kind of autonomous generation of sequence here, but of course the robot is moving around the world. That's why these inputs are moving around. So what triggers the transitions here is still the behavior changing the sensory inputs that the system gets. So the generalization of this uh, essentially focus your focuses on this uh, mechanism. And um, in this generalization, what I just showed you is the example where uh, the prediction is made, you know, in our case, this dimension was the same dimension. The prediction is made making a subthreshold peak and then a sensor in the world has to overlap with that prediction and then you get a peak and that peak will delete the original intention. But uh, you could have other cases where it's actually not coming from the world, it's coming from some internal state, from a consequence of your intention on um, just some other fields in your uh, big cognitive architecture and where uh, the predicted neural state, so what you're predicting is some neural state where that from the peak, uh, you're predicting that a peak will arise in certain field and you could have a peak detector, which means that you measure something about the neural state and when it detects a peak, then uh, it looks, if it's the right peak, then it will fire. And this goes through the detection instability, uh, suppresses the original peak, which goes through the reverse detection instability. And then uh, that releases 
this prediction, so the input goes away. This goes through the reverse detection and stability. And then um, because it's no longer there, it no longer inhibits. And so this field is open to creating a new peak. And so I think I'm, I'm going to do this next week. I want to next week um, show you this generalization working in, um, in, in a couple of different contexts. And I'll take you through the same example again by comparing it then to other approaches to sequence generation. So I'll close this uh, lecture a little bit uh, in the middle of it. <laughs>